Hi everybody, today I'm gonna to talk about Rootstock and Sovereign. These are uh, two protocols that exist on top of Bitcoin and act as Bitcoin's smart contract layer. This is part of my series covering Bitcoin DeFi. I'll include links below for the previous episodes where I wrote about other protocols like Stacks, and I'm gonna be writing about Lightning and DLCs in the future. And before we begin, I want to give a shout out to Ledin. Ledin is where I earn yield on my Bitcoin. So if you want to, if you have a bunch of Bitcoin, you want to earn some yield, check out Ledin, L-E-D-N. Link is below. Great place. Personally use it. Definitely recommend it. All right, let's go ahead and hop on in. So uh, with Bitcoin DeFi, there's a lot of ground to cover, and I would definitely recommend that you check out the basics that I wrote about. So in this, um, you know, in the basics one, I write about like what is DeFi. Um, you know, what uh, what the nuances are of how it works, etc. It's kind of a high level overview. You might want to start there and I'll include a link below before you dig in further. But um, what what's really cool about this is I think like Bitcoin DeFi is a much more stable foundation. So, you know, with Ethereum, with these other protocols, you're building DeFi on top of, I don't think, as strong of a foundation as Bitcoin. And Elise Kyleen from, uh, she's a, been a long time Bitcoin VC, she talks about how, you know, building DeFi on an inherently centralized or broken protocol isn't the best way to build DeFi. You got to have a sturdy foundation. And so I, I agree. I think that the Bitcoin protocol is the best protocol to build DeFi or these applications on top of. And a few months ago, I put out a, a survey asking folks which protocols they wanted to hear about first for Bitcoin DeFi. First one is Stacks. I already wrote, the, wrote about that. Link will be below. Uh, there's Sovereign RSK. This is the next one. And then later this year, I'll be talking about like a liquid, liquid, lightning and DLCs. Um, you know, I don't recommend any owning any other token other than Bitcoin. Um, the SOV token I've been given is used to play around with the protocol. You don't need the Sovereign token to, to utilize Sovereign. That's what's kind of cool about it is you can use the native RBTC. And that's basically a representation of Bitcoin. So, OK, let's go ahead and hop in. What is Rootstock? So Rootstock is a smart contract platform that uh, takes that is rooted in, into Bitcoin, all puns intended, via merge mining. So essentially Bitcoin miners with very little effort can merge mine both Rootstock and Bitcoin. And um, what's cool too is it had no pre-mine as well, so there's no um, pre-created tokens. One RBTC equals one BTC on the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and I'll get into how that works in a second. So via merge mining, you know, Rootstock believes in proof of work and Bitcoin's, um, you know, Bitcoin security. Around 47% of all miners choose to opt in to merge mine with RBTC uh, or choose to merge mine uh, Rootstock. And here is uh, a representation of the network. Now these rates change. Today it's 36% are merge mining, but that totally depends on how many miner, you know, totally depends on the market. So last night when I wrote this, it was more like 47%. Um, what's cool is that the, the miners earn RBTC because transaction fees are paid in RBTC. Basically it's additional Bitcoin, which is kind of cool because RBTC equals a Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network. And there are some complexities and theoretical risks. So BitMEX, really, really great. They put out really, really great research content. Uh, same with Kraken as well, but I don't think Kraken's written about this. Um, th this is a great article digging into the nuances of, of merge mining and, and uh, the risks and rewards of it. So, you know, as we um, go through here, keep in mind that, you know, Rootstock is is very much kind of like a pendant to Bitcoin. We can kind of think about it as a layer two technology, kind of like lightning um, to where, you know, as you go higher up in the uh, stack, so like going from layer one to layer two, you give up some settlement assurances. Um, if you want to settle large values, you typically want to do it on the base layer where you have the greatest settlement assurances. The more and more you move up the stack, the less and less assurances that you have. So what's really cool about how uh, Rootstock works is that it's connected to the Bitcoin blockchain via a two-way peg or a bridge. And that's where when you want to use Bitcoin on Rootstock, you lock up Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain and then they create RBTC on the Rootstock blockchain. So there's only 21 million Bitcoin total if you look at all the Bitcoin on Rootstock and Bitcoin. So there is no additional pre-mined amount. There is no additional Bitcoin. One Bitcoin on RBTC equals one Bitcoin in the Bitcoin blockchain. And so the way that they do this or build this bridge is they create a semi-trusted setup called a federation. 
The role of the Federation is to determine uh, when coins are released or locked up. Um, it's part of a, you know, this is where, again, you're trading off settlement insurances and you're trading off trust a little bit here. So it's part of a multi-sig wallet that this Federation controls and they have certain parameters in terms of when they unlock and lock funds. Uh, the members chosen for this are typically well-trusted individuals in the space, or individuals or companies in the space. There's enough um, there's enough folks in the federation where it's really hard to get a majority to do anything malicious, um, and basically it's the multi-sig, so X number of participants have to sign to get a transaction through. There's a ton more depth here, but I don't have time to dig into all the nuances, and I want to get to Sovereign because Sovereign, I think, is the most interesting part of all this. And Sovereign exists as an application on the Rootstock blockchain or on the Rootstock network. Um, and uh, you know, one last shout out. So again, Ledin uh, is the best place to earn a yield on your Bitcoin. Again, I personally use it. Definitely check it out. The sign up button here is here. You get a twenty-five dollar bonus for signing up. Okay, continuing on. Sovereign. So Sovereign is a non-custodial and permissionless smart contract system for Bitcoin lending, borrowing, yield farming, and margin trading. So basically all your sort of trading needs, it's, it's I think, the best representation that I've seen so far in terms of a, a usable interface uh, for Bitcoin DeFi. Now, it primarily resides on the Rootstock blockchain, but there is some connectivity to other layer twos like Lightning and Ethereum. So SOV is the native to currency of Sovereign. It's a governance token. For those unfamiliar with what a governance token is, it allows folks who hold the SOV token to vote on various proposals. And it's sort of, it's kind of like quasi like equity. There's a lot of, of debate whether it's truly equity or not. Um, I think that's going to be an ongoing discussion. It gives you voting rights, but again, the, you know, vote, do voting rights give you, um, does it actually give you equity level of ownership? And then, and again, that's a really nuanced debate there. But that's the that's I'm trying to make it as simple as possible for folks who are new to uh, DeFi and new to what the idea of a governance token is. Um, RBTC, the native Bitcoin equivalent on the rootstock block protocol, is what uh, SOV uses to power its smart contracts. So there's no additional token you need to use to use Sovereign. You don't need to use the Sovereign token. You can use R, uh, RBTC the entire time. In fact, that's what powers every single smart contract. SOV is just the governance token to govern um, how uh, certain decisions are made with the pro with the with Sovereign uh, the Sovereign protocol. And Sovereign as well is used as an incentive mechanism to uh, pay uh, liquidity providers to build out some of these services. Okay, so what can you do with it? Why why are people so crazy about DeFi in general? Well, and I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here. So, for example, you can swap uh, between one token and another. So you could swap between XUSD, which is a stable coin that they have on on Sovereign, uh, for our BTC, so for Bitcoin. And when you click the swap button, that, that uh, accesses the liquidity pool uh, where folks are earning, um, where different liquidity providers are earning a yield by acting as automated market makers, which we'll get into in a minute. And in fact, I'm going to dive in pretty deep into automated, automated market makers because I feel like that is one of the least understood things about DeFi in general. Um, you can also do margin trading. So you can lock up, uh, you, can, you can borrow against using some of your funds as collateral. You can, you can trade against that. Um, and then you can additionally just borrow as well. You don't have to trade with that. You can borrow assets using your, your other assets as collateral and then go use that asset wherever you'd like. And then there's the lending pool. So lending pool is where you can earn interest on lending your coins to traders and borrowers. Um, as you can see, the yield on Bitcoin is pretty damn low. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, it's only like 0.6% a year. This is because there's more supply than demand. Um, these low rates are what we similarly would see for rates on Bitcoin on the Ethereum net, on, on Ethereum DeFi as well. So interest payments are made to borrowers and distributed to lenders. The Sovereign Protocol collects 10% as part of this insurance fund, which protects lenders in the possible case of a, a loan default, which can occur um, if the market moves really fast and there's a there's a an issue with how the smart contracts have been configured. So this is the interface for that, which um, again, this is some of the best, inter these are the best interfaces I've seen for Bitcoin DeFi um, out there. Uh, governance wise, you have the SOV token. So um, in the Bit Bitocracy um, section on the website, you can uh, dig in further on the ability to like figure out, uh, you know, to vote on various topics or to, I think you can stake it, but I'm not exactly sure what that does. Um, by the way, all of these interfaces are accessible via the Sovereign website. So um, let me go ahead and open that up. 
Yeah, so here is where you can pop between these. So everything I showed you is on the website. So you can you can browse this without logging in. You log in via clicking engage wallet and then you can log in via hardware wallet, which a lot of like DeFi protocols don't have this and I like that they have this function or browser wallet. And so, um, yeah, I forgot to call that out earlier. I really wanted to get us soon to the uh, AMM side or yield farming. I think a lot of people, it seems so con like you either know it or you don't know it. And there's a lot of people don't know it and they just kind of YOLO and throw their coins into yield farming, but they don't really understand what's going on. So here, and I'm, I'm gonna try to distill it as simply as possible. So traders can interact with a pool by getting a quoted price for any asset pair. So let's say there's a BTC USD liquidity pool. So a trader goes, I want to buy, I've got $10,000 and I wanna buy Bitcoin. So the protocol is like, cool, this is how much it's gonna cost you if you want it from this liquidity pool. Uh, the slippage is already baked in, fees are already baked in. On the opposite side of that trade, there are liquidity providers yield farming. So what they're doing is they deposit both Bitcoin and uh, USD into the liquidity pool and they earn a fee when you trade. So the, the trader, places this trade, accesses the pool from the liquidity from the liquidity pool, the liquidity pool providers, liquidity providers, they earn a, a return on that. You can kind of think about it like an exchange fee. So you earn an exchange fee. Um, and also these protocols, whether it be on Ethereum or Bitcoin, offer an incentive to provide liquidity. And with Sovereign, we can see this in their interface where we see these different, uh, these four different boxes here. These are the um, essentially incentive liquidity. So. Um, for example, like if you deposit into the um, ETH, uh, ETHS RBTC pool, there's a uh, SOV token uh, offered as an incentive to post liquidity there. So, you know, I really, <laughs> there's a term in the space called impermanent loss. Basically, it's a watered down version of you fucking lost money. Um, <laughs> so, and this exists for not just Sovereign, but also other, every other liquidity pool, AMM, on any protocol. So this is just a, a general sweeping, um, um, sweeping kind of a explanation on this. So I find this term really disingenuous and permanent loss water, really waters down what it is. Like I said before, it's you lost money. So what happens here is that the price of the asset moves in one direction over an extended period of time. This leaves liquidity providers worth more of one asset versus another. For example, let's say Bitcoin goes on a bull run and you're a liquidity provider for the BTC USD pool. Well, you're gonna be left with a lot more USD if Bitcoin moves in a, in a trajectory upwards for an extended period of time. So when you see these crazy high yields where people are like, oh, with yield farming, I earn all this yield, it's really just a combination of incentive yield from the protocol, like SOV, getting SOV tokens, and people speculating on the SOV token. So they're, they're giving, you know, let's say I'm an early liquidity provider. Um, they usually give you more of that, um, of that protocol token to get you on boarded early. So there, there's incentive for you to get there early. And then people start to speculate as to what the value of that governance token is. And so that's why you see these insane yields. It's that combined with harvesting volatility at the expense of the performance of the asset. So for example, um, it's basically like a little bit of, not, not, it's not like selling covered calls, but in essence, um, you know, you are, you are earning yield on volatility because you're posting liquidity and when there's a lot of trading, you earn a lot, a lot in fees. But if you were to just hold the underlying asset, you know, that, that, that yield that you could earn on liquidity mining could be far, far less. And what you're really doing is if the asset, you know, moved in one direction, you're really trading all that upside or you're trading, you're, you're selling volatility in order to earn a yield. So, I think this is the most succinct way to describe these very high yields that we see in DeFi. It's a combination of incentive yield plus speculation on the token and har uh, volatility harvesting. So, you know, a few shout outs here on risks. With any DeFi protocol, there's inherent risks with the underlying smart contracts. Uh, Sovereign has undergone a series of audits, which are uh, you can view here. I'm not at all saying that this protocol is, is safe. I am not saying that I vouch for the quality of the audits. I have no idea how well these have been done. Um, I mean this as well for any other audits that have been done on Ethereum or any other blockchain. Um, you know, ex exploits are found semi-often on the Ethereum uh, network and Ethereum DeFi, so I think it'd be safe to assume that this could happen over on the Bitcoin DeFi side. So in conclusion, Bitcoin DeFi is a fascinating topic that I've been diving into recently. 
um, you know, first with a basic overview, then with stacks, and all these links will be included below, and now with uh, Rootstock and Sovereign. A Sovereign's super interesting because it's one of the most well-polished Bitcoin DeFi interfaces I've interacted with. Um, of course, there's some controversy as to the risks and implementations of the various D Bitcoin DeFi protocols I've taken a look at. Definitely recommend you all check it out here. So kind of like a compare contrast of Stacks and RSK. Um, both sides, I think, have very strong opinions as to the weaknesses and strengths of either or. Um, in the next, next in the series will be DLCs, discrete log contracts, and Lightning. So if you, re if you like this episode, if you like this explanation of Bitcoin DeFi, make sure to subscribe. Um, this not only will let you know next time I come out with content, but also will help my channel. I uh, really appreciate you watching. Thanks. Cheers.